Are Harry and Meghan living in the land of delusion? Or is Netflix setting them up for a major fail? I believe Netflix is setting them up. Let's talk about it. When you think about this couple, they have not been producing for Netflix. And Netflix has become the brunt of many jokes because they have been giving money to these grifters, as people would call them, with an F in front of it. Now, Netflix is tired of them not producing. But the thing is, you can't really just cut and run if you have a contract. You have to make it look like you've been trying to get things out of them and that they were just not producing. So they will go along with an idea that they might have and make them do the production of it. And it doesn't necessarily mean by the time it's in fruition and made, that Netflix will even air it. So when there's talks of these new ideas from the couple, Netflix is like, okay, fine. You hire everybody, you get it done, and then we'll see whether or not we want to put it on the television. So with Harry's new effort talking about polo and it being his passion subject, this may not ever hit the air, and I believe it won't. Polo is not something that most people can really grasp an interest to. Unless you play or have been born into royalty or have a lot of money, polo is not a sport that most everyday people are driven towards. Think about it. I'm in the United States. In the United States, we have our football. And then we have baseball. And then we have basketball. Those are the major sports that most people get behind their team and watch and get a very huge interest in their lives at. Polo is not really one of those sports. Polo is something that a wealthy person may give a huge donation to the charity that it isn't working with, but because they're looking for a huge tax write-off. Not necessarily that they want to play or they know anybody who's playing, it's more or less something to go watch, be seen at, and give a little bit of a donation to. I believe Harry is trying to really hold on to that former life of a royal subject where he is the prince of the realm, in which reality he's just a former prince who lives in America now. Now, we all know that he has been doing polo matches for a few years now and carrying a camera crew with him. People had thought at one point they were Netflix cameras, but no, they are actually their personal people that they've been paying to follow him around so he could get this idea of a Netflix series together to give to them. But the problem that Harry seems to not understand is he's not the popular prince that he was in the late 90s. He is looked at in a much worse light since moving to America and constantly talking in a negative way about the monarchy in general, the royal family, his father, his brother, and his stepmother. He is not looking like somebody who should be a grateful person for everything that he is given to. But no, he is a person who is never happy with what he's been given. He is always looking to say that he needed more or wanted more or he should have been given more. And really, Americans don't relate to that. We don't relate to somebody who was given everything on a silver platter and basically says, I want more and that's not enough. In America, we look at that and think of, well, you've been given so much, you should be helping so many. But that's not the couple. That's not Harry and Meghan. This is all about their popularity and how they're going to have this popularity rise in America because they lost it all when they left the UK. Now, when it comes to Meghan's new venture, American Riviera Orchard, which to me has always sounded like a winery, she is wanting to pitch an idea of a cooking show slash talk show slash friendship show 
where they all just sit around and talk about things. Very Hollywood kind of early 90s with Oprah. And then you had people like now Drew Barrymore has a show and Kelly Clarkson where they all just sit on a couch and they talk and they might have a cooking segment. And then they'll have like a friendship gab where they'll all talk about, oh, do you remember this and that and everything else? But really, Megan doesn't have a wide circle of friends. She might be able to get a few people that came to her podcast, some cast off friends that most people don't either know or don't want to know. Or she might get Serena Williams to pop over for a few minutes. But she doesn't have this huge circle of friends that really seems like something you want to get into and be part of and want that to be your way of knowing her. But that's what she's wanting to do. I think her jumping the gun and doing her Instagram page and her website really showed her how truly unpopular she was. Because in her mind, she thought she would have millions and millions of subscribers by now, which is definitely not the case. I also think her having nothing on the Instagram or nothing on the website, except for some really creepy photos and a creepy video, it really looked more like American Horror Story than anything that would be a positive brand for her. But... This is what Megan wants to do because she feels like Harry, that as long as her name is out there in the atmosphere, the people will just clamor to be around them. I think one of the reasons they have misguided it is because they are becoming almost so disliked in the Hollywood community because they're users. They're constantly borrowing people's jets to go places they never pay for themselves the typical person who has a lot of money but still is using the person who's working for theirs now why i think netflix is setting them up to fail is simply this when it comes time for any type of renewal talk with their contractor possibly even leaving they're going to be able to say to this couple that we gave you these opportunities. We gave you the ability to put these things up, your polo show, your talk show, your website thing, but you never truly came across with any actual production. And without any production, there's no work. But without work, there's no contract, and we definitely don't need you anymore. So I think Harry and Meghan are either going to put up or shut up, because in the end, if they don't produce... Netflix is just going to move on. As a sponsor of the Royal Navy's newest frigate, the Princess Royal has visited HMS Ventura and Ross. Her Royal Highness met with those responsible for constructing the UK's first Type 31 warship, as well as the sailors charged with breathing life into the 455-foot vessel and turning her into a working warship ready to serve around the globe. The Princess Royal is also royal sponsor of Devonport-based assault ship HMS Albion, Commodore-in-Chief of Portsmouth Naval Base, and the Chief Commandant of Women in the Royal Navy, among numerous long-standing associations with the Senior Service. As the ship sponsor, Her Royal Highness will have an opportunity to be the guest of honor at key moments in HMS Ventures' life, such as naming her and commissioning ceremonies, and will receive regular updates on the ship's deeds and the activities of the 100-plus men and women on board. Today, with the frigate still under construction, the ship's company were introduced to their new sponsor as the Princess Royal toured both the assembled facility and Vitura itself. The frigate is more than two years into construction, with the hull and much of the superstructure complete and is covered as state-of-the-art assembly facility with the defense firm Babka is building all five ships in the Type 31 inspection class. When completed, Ventura and her four sister ships will perform widespread duties around the globe, anything from operating independently on maritime security patrols to escorting the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier stride groups to operating side by side with the UK partners and allies.
To complete the visit, Her Royal Highness was presented two long service and good conduct medals to two of the HMS Ventura's ship company, including leading hand Adam Duncan, the ship's newest and most junior member. Wallace Simpson, the Duchess of Windsor, was frantic with worry. October 16, 1946, Wallace and her husband, the Duke of Windsor, the former Edward VIII, had left Edenham Lodge in Berkshire, where they had been staying with friends for dinner at Claridge Hotel in London. In their absence, a daring raid took place at the house, and the jewelry of Wallace's that's worth as much as 25,000 pounds, around 1.3 million pounds today, was stolen, never to be recovered. It infected both the Duke and Duchess deeply. Edward later wrote to his brother, King George VI, to describe his visit to Britain. He preferred to reside in either America or France after his abdication in 1936 as an eye-opener and mentioned that he had discovered the bitter and costly way that Great Britain is no longer the secure and law-abiding country it used to be. On paper, it was an outrageous crime, and that one remains mysterious to today. No perpetrator was ever apprehended. Yet there have been many suspicions, both at the time and after Wallace's death in 1986, that the theft from the home of the Lord and Lady Dudley was either an inside job done with complicity of the cash-strapped Windsors, or alternatively, the jewels were never stolen at all. In the new book, Power and Glory, many discussions of the oddities surrounding the theft. The first one is, rather than placing the jewelry in a secured lock strong room, they left it in a box under the bed. Although the room was being watched by the Windsor's detective, thieves were able to enter the house around six in the evening as the detective left for dinner. The burglars were said to have climbed up a long white rope, and climbed through a window of the daughter's and went straight to the Duchess's room, ignoring all other items of value, taking the jewel box under the bed and leaving undetected. After Wallace's maid triggered the alarm, Edwin and Lodge was plunged into an uproar. Because of the high-profile nature, Scotland Yard dispatched their own guards. When Edward and Wallace arrived, they had behaved in almost exaggerated panic and anger. In her memoirs, Lady Dudley wrote that the Duchess, that although she was in a bad way, she demonstrated an unpleasant and yet to unexpected side of her character, demanding all a long-standing household service be put through a kind of third degree. The hostess refused, saying that all of except one kitchen maid were old and devoted staff of long-standing. Nonetheless, Wallace interrogated the maid as if she had committed the crime, despite the complete lack of any evidence against her. While Lady Dudley allowed that they were both demented with worry and near to tears, this was not becoming the behavior of a duchess. The next day, 18 individual earrings were found scattered nearby the golf course. Much to Wallace's continued anger, none of them made a matching pair. Fabergé boxes and a string of pearls had belonged to Queen Alexandra, the Duke's grandmother, was discarded as if they were simply worthless trinkets. A selection of the missing jewelry was made, and it was an impressive list. Rumors soon circulated that the jewelry was worth as much as £250,000, leading Edward to put out a statement saying this is absolutely no truth of the statement. The value of the jewelry was not £250,000. It was more like £20,000. He sighed to his American friend, Robert Young, that the crime was a tough break, both for the substantial financial loss and because the sentimental and historic value of some of the objects are far higher. He suggested that I have not yet given up hope on the recovery of bits and pieces of the hull, but we are both feeling pretty sunk about it right now and blame the press for worsening matters, say the sensational British newspapers have not spared us in capitalism upon our misfortune. No were the police helpful. Inspector Kapschik immediately decided without any evidence that the robbery could not have been an inside job, nor that the Duke and Duchess could have had anything to do with it. Instead, he decided a 27-year-old local man and petty criminal, Leslie Holmes, was the perpetrator. The inspector became obsessed with trying to prove Holmes's guilt but was not able to do so. 
In 1987, Sotheby's in Geneva held a sale of Wallace's effects, and at least 30 of the jewels that were supposed to have been stolen were offered at auction. Leslie Field, the official historian of Royal Jewel Collections, stated that I believe the Duchess of Windsor defrauded the insurers by overstating the numbers and identifications of the jewels which helped dispose of. And then they had, from the beginning, been in a strong box in Paris and remained there. The most charitable view is that there really had been a robbery, connected by a person or persons unknown, and that Edward and Wallace capitalized on the crime in order to pocket the insurance money, exaggerating the losses for their own benefit. The less generous perspective is that it was a phony theft and they had planned by the Duke and Duchess from the beginning, which would support Lady Dudley's belief that Wallace's show of outrage and anger seemed disingenuous. Either way, it shows the most controversial royal couple of the 20th century in a uniquely unflattering light, even if we may not know what the definite story of what happened that evening at the Edmund Lodge. The Duke of Edinburgh has attended the commissioning ceremony of a new naval ship, which will help safeguard UK waters from underwater threats. The Royal Fleet Auxiliary Stirling Castle was formally dedicated during a high-profile ceremony. The ship marks a move away from traditional mine hunting, embracing cutting-edge technology as she acts as a mothership for an array of remotely operated and autonomous systems, which will scour home waters looking for mines. With Stirling Castle due to begin operations later this year, a break from training offered the ideal opportunity to welcome the new ship into the RFA family in the presence of the service's commander-in-chief, the Duke of Edinburgh. RFA Stirling Castle is helping to extend the reach and effectiveness of the Royal Navy mine hunting operations and to make it safer for those sailors whose job it is to locate and destroy mines. His Royal Highness joined Commander David Ingalls, the head of the RFA, and civic leaders from Stirling on the tour of the ship, which will act as a mothership for an array of remotely operated and autonomous systems that will scour home waters looking for the mines. The Prince of Wales and Prince George attended an Aston Villa match together in their first public outing since the Princess of Wales' cancer announcement. Prince William was seen smiling and applauding in the Villa Park stands in Birmingham with his eldest son on Thursday evening. George sported an Aston Villa scarf as the pair celebrated the club's 2-1 to -one win against Lily, the first leg of the European Conference League quarterfinal. William was seen turning to his son to say something as they applauded Ollie Watkins' opening goal for the club. In March, the Princess of Wales revealed she was undergoing treatment for cancer in an emotional video message. She, the Prince of Wales, and their three children all missed Easter Sunday service at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, following the announcement despite attending last year. Since revealing the diagnosis, the Prince and Princess of Wales are said to be enormously touched and extremely moved, by the public's warmth and support. The king, who has been carrying out low-key official duties behind the palace walls, made his most significant public appearance at the Easter service, 
since his own cancer diagnosis was announced in the start of February. He was described by the palace as being so proud of the princess and her courage and speaking out and is said to have been in close contact with his beloved daughter-in-law. Prince William has been a long football fan and posted a message of congratulations to the Lionesses, Rachel Daly, on her retirement on the Prince and Princess of Wales social media accounts earlier this week. I always love to see Prince William and Prince George together when they go to sporting events. They seem to have such a wonderful time. They really have a closeness. And with everything that is going on with Princess Catherine and her illness, it is a good sign for them to go out and have this father and son time. When you're in the royal bubble, you always seem to have all eyes on you. And when they're having a good time and just enjoying themselves, watching one of their favorite teams, watching one of their favorite sports, is a really wonderful thing for them to do. And I'm so glad that William and George were able to be there and have such a good time. 